We're trying to find a special kind of truth inside ourselves, the truth of the end of suffering, a deathless dimension that can be touched at the mind. And the Buddha describes the steps in awakening to the truth. You start by finding a teacher who's reliable, and you listen to the Dhamma. You pay careful attention. You try to remember the Dhamma. All of that comes under discernment that comes from listening. Then the next steps do a discernment that comes from thinking. You take what the Dharma you've heard and you compare it with other lessons you've learned. And you think about it. So what you have learned recently makes sense in terms of what you've learned before. That's the discernment that comes from thinking. And then there's the discernment that comes from developing. It starts with the desire to put the Dharma into practice. All too often we're told that desire is a bad thing in the path, but actually it's an important part of right effort. Without the desire you wouldn't embark on this path. Based on the desire, the Buddha says, you become willing. In other words, you take the teachings of the Buddha and you say that you're going to use those to judge the thoughts in your mind. That's a big step right there, because all too often we think the things we want to think and we don't think the things we don't want to think, except when the things that we want to think turn on us and start driving us crazy. But by and large, our likes and dislikes play a huge role in what we choose to think about. And yet the Buddha says the things that we crave and the things that we cling to cause us to suffer and actually are the suffering in the mind. So it's going to require that we change our priorities inside. When the Buddha sets out the Four Noble Truths, he says they're the types of thoughts that give rise to suffering. They come from craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming. And then there are the thoughts that lead away from suffering. Starting with thoughts of right view, right resolve, your intention to follow, right speech, right action, right livelihood. And then as you train the mind to get it into concentration so it stays with one object. Those kinds of thoughts you want to develop. So this is a reordering of our priorities. A lot of times it goes against the grain, but we have to realize that it's for our own good. But you can tell yourself only so long it's for your own good. If there's nothing to show for it, then the mind starts to wander away. This is one of the reasons why we practice right concentration, to give rise to a sense of well-being. You sit here, just you and the breath. And you ask yourself, what potential for happiness is there? But the Buddha says that by secluding our thoughts from sensuality, in other words, we stop fantasizing about sensual pleasures. And you're just present for the sensation of the breathing as it's coming in, going out. What's the potential there for pleasure? What's the potential for rapture, fullness? It's there. Other people have found it. Ask yourself what kind of breathing would help give rise to a sense of fullness in the body, what way of perceiving the breath would give rise to a sense of fullness. What would you like right now? You're doing this to keep that original desire alive. As the Buddha said, you have the desire, then there's the willingness. And then you compare, he says, you compare what the Buddha taught to what you're doing in the, in the mind right now, and seeing what's working and what's not. This ability to reflect is important. In fact, it's so important that the Buddha one time said that the two things you need in order to nourish the Dharma inside are commitment and reflection. You commit yourself to doing it, 
and then you reflect on what you're doing. You learn how to pass skillful judgment on what you're doing. And if things aren't working, you try to figure out what's wrong. There are lots of things you can be doing with the mind. Sometimes it needs simply to rest. Other times you need to push it, be a little extra strict with it. In other words, the breath is comfortable and the mind starts wandering around. You have to remind yourself you're not here to wander around. You're here to stay with the breath. So you have to ride her on it for a while. And there are times when you have to step, step back and evaluate and think about it. One of the first things you have to evaluate, of course, is when is a good time to evaluate and when do you just leave the mind alone and let it stay still. That's something you have to learn with, with practice. You have to learn how to read your own mind. The Buddha gives the image of a cook working for a king. And sometimes the king will explicitly say that he likes this dish or that dish. Other times the king doesn't say anything, but there are signs, the dish that he reaches for, the dish that he empties out. And without his having to say anything, the wise cook can pick up, oh, this is something that the, the king likes, and so he makes more of that. As for things the king doesn't like, he makes less of that. And you know how kings are, they're pretty fickle. Sometimes today they like something, sometimes tomorrow they don't like something. The same thing. So you have to watch out for that too, you have to provide for that as well. Well, your mind is that way too, your mind can be very fickle. Today it likes long breathing, tomorrow it doesn't like long breathing. Today it likes to explore the breath sensations in the different parts of the body, other days it wants to focus in really strongly just on one spot. We've got to learn how to read it. And that way the mind gets to rest as it likes. And you maintain that sense of desire to practice. There are other times when you have to talk to the mind to get into the right mood. It's not willing to settle down with the breath, no matter what kind of breath you cook for it. In which case you have to ask yourself, well, what else could you settle down with? Or when it's getting discouraged, you're sitting here and there's pain, you're sitting here, nothing seems to work. Well, you remind yourself you're, you're doing something good. Remember the Buddha's way of giving a Dharma talk, he would instruct, in other words, give people information. But then he would also urge, rouse, and encourage people. One part instruction, three parts encouragement. This would be called gladdening the mind. In other words, thinking in ways that remind you that you're glad to be here. You learn how to read the mind, you learn how to provide for it. And John Lee gives the example of someone who knows their child. The child cries in this way, you know that it's hungry. It cries in that way, you know that it wants to be picked up. It cries in this way, you have to change the diaper. It cries in that way, it's just being ornery, so you leave it alone. When you learn how to read its cries, then the child will be happy. And same with the mind, you have to learn how to read what it's doing. Because as you're Meditating, you're taking on two roles. One, you've got the mind that has to be trained, but also there's part of the mind that is the trainer. Or you might make a comparison like a John Foyle did with a teacher and a student. Part of your mind is a student trying to learn the meditation. Another part is the teacher picking up lessons from outside, watching over the student, making sure the student does the work that he has to do. And the teacher knows when to be strict, when to be lenient, when to give the student work, when to give the student something more enjoyable. The student will be happy to learn. 
and the teacher gets wiser as well. You think about teachers in real life. Student teachers have a lot to learn. But over time, as they begin to learn how to read the students, they become more reliable as teachers. So you start out looking for a reliable teacher outside so that you can become a reliable teacher inside. This is how the path progresses. Or as the Buddha says, you hover around your practice with right view, right mindfulness, and right effort. Right view is basically the, the Buddhist standards. Right mindfulness is how you remind yourself of those standards. Part of right mindfulness, of course, is alertness. You watch yourself to see what you're doing and the results you're getting. And then there's, then there's right effort. If things aren't going well, you make an effort to make them go well. And then you read that. That's why these qualities, as the Buddha said, circle around every factor of the path. So the ability to reflect on yourself is an important part of the practice. This is why the Buddha, when he introduced his son to the practice, one of the first things he gave him as an image to think about was the image of a mirror. You look at your actions, you learn how to judge them properly, and you get more and more skillful. You look at your actions in the same way that you would look in a mirror to see your face. You look at your actions not just to look at them, but to purify them. Just as you look at your face, not to just look at your face, but to see is there anything that needs to be cleaned, anything that needs to be straightened out. And you can read yourself in this way. You realize that's a really important part of the meditation. It's not just technique, it's also learning how to master a skill with the kind of reflection that that requires. That's how you're going to progress. <laughs>